Good afternoon. My name is Cynthia Runge, and I am the owner of Parado Family Law in Boston, Massachusetts. We are a full service family law firm in Boston. Um, we have another terrific quarterly Zoom presentation for you today, Hot Topics in Immigration and Family Law. Who knew there could be such a thing? Well, I'm here to tell you that there certainly are some hot topics. Um, I wanna, before we get started, couple of logistical things. So this Zoom is being recorded. Uh, and it, it's also going to be put on our YouTube channel, my Parado Family Laws YouTube channel. So if you don't want your name to show up in the chat, please rename yourself so that it's anonymous. If you ask a question, your voice will be recorded. So if you don't want your voice recorded, um, you should either put a question in um, the Q&A or the chat. Um, otherwise, you, you'll end up on the audio. So without further ado, I am delighted to introduce uh, to you Shiva Karimi and Danielle Huntley Webb, both extraordinary immigration attorneys. Um, both Danielle and Shiva's bios are in our PowerPoint, but let's hear a little bit more about the speakers from the speakers themselves. Danielle, can you tell our audience a little bit about yourself and your interest? Oh, of course. Uh, thanks, Cindy. Uh, so my name is Danielle. I'm an immigration attorney with clients all over the world. I focus my practice mostly on uh, both business immigration and family immigration. So I represent a lot of companies, investors uh, of all sorts, and a lot of families. Uh, my biggest family category of cases I handle are marriage-based cases. Foreigners uh, marrying a U.S. citizen or a legal permanent resident and it often comes up a lot in my business cases too, because a lot of my beneficiaries of my corporate clients are married. So it, it comes up a lot. Um, I live in Southern New Hampshire. That's where I'm speaking to you, speaking to you from right now. Um, and I live here with my husband and my two very, very large dogs, um, Jed the Great Dane and Luna the Great Pyrenees. So um, I'm, I'm lucky to do what I do and to love what I do. Thank you. All right, Shiva, can you tell us a little bit about yourself and your background? Great, thanks, Cindy, and thanks for um, having us today. It's it's uh, fun to be on this webinar with you. Um, so my name is Shiva Karimi. I'm an immigration attorney as well. I practice at McLean Middleton. Um, I have been with this firm since 2014, and prior to that, I had my own practice for about 14 years in Boston. Um, at McLean, I chair the immigration law practice group, and I'm the managing director of the Boston office. Um, I found quite a good fit, enjoy the firm very much, and my colleagues as well. Um, I live in Newton, Massachusetts. I have um, five combined children, um, so quite a busy household. We threw two cats into the mix, so <laughs> following Danielle's lead of the pets, they are also quite pudgy. Um, <laughs> and uh, <laughs> um, and um, uh, just, you know, juggling a day-to-day -day balance as, as many of us do. Um, so that's my background. Well, thank you both for being here today, ladies. Um, and uh, I've already sort of explained my background. So before we dive into the intricacies of immigration law and how it can impact your family law case or vice versa, we're going to do a little icebreaker. So they didn't know this was coming, um, but hey, life is full of surprises. So um, our icebreaker is, Danielle, what is your favorite Broadway musical? <laughs> I'm going to sound really basic, uh, but it's, it's Les Miserables. It's the one I sing the most. My family sings the most. Um, I'm from a family of theater people. I did theater all through high school, so can break into song very, very quickly and often do. Um, and just Les Mis just speaks to me and it always has. Hey, you know, it's, it's going to be in Boston. Uh, I saw that. I saw that. I've seen it a bunch of times. It's just, it's, it's, it's pure nostalgia for me. Excellent. All right, Shiva, you're up. So I'm glad you asked this question, actually, because uh, earlier this year, we went with our five children to New York City. And one night, you know, we didn't have anything to do. So we went into Times Square and, you know, you, you can buy tickets day of the show um, and, you know, heard a couple descriptions and we ended up buying tickets to Some Like It Hot. And I don't know if you've heard about this. It's a new musical. Um, it's sort of a, a take on the, you know, the, the prior from like, I think the 1940s or so, except with a very modern twist. And it deals with a lot of um, sort of 
diversity issues and things like that. And we didn't know we were walking into, we thought we were just walking into, you know, musical comedy, that kind of thing. And it was all of those things, but it also had some very extraordinary, um, you know, deep meaning and um, all of our children ranging from age 10 to 14 loved it, enjoyed it. They all took a lot of meaning away from it. We loved it. Um, we were all floored by it. And just, you know, I've been, I've been advertising it to everybody who will listen, but um, it, it's, it's amazing, amazing cast, highly recommend it. We really just, just were blown away by it. Wow. I'm going to have to check that out yeah, 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 <laughs> on my next trip. All right. Um, well, it's time to talk about immigration and family law issues. So this is directed to both of our speakers. And now what I'm gonna do is pull up our, um, our PowerPoint here. So just give me a moment. Uh, the intricacies of Zoom. All right. Okay, so this um, just a little bit about our program and anyone who would like to get a copy of the PowerPoint, you're welcome. We've got fantastic pictures of Danielle and Shiva here. So um, starting off at the top, um, how do, um, well, what happens when immigration and family law issues collide? So just starting off, um, how often do you find that it, family law comes up in your cases? And this is just generally to either Shiva or Danielle. I think actually Danielle gave a good introduction in the beginning, you know, talking about how there's a, a, always a crossover. Um, I, I will say, um, and I didn't add this in, in the introduction, but the my practice area is mostly business immigration. But as, as Danielle said, you, you, you know, everybody has family members. So um, whether it's a corporate client who's coming up with, you know, they're getting married to somebody who's a foreign national or, um, uh, you know, they're bringing independence. You know, th th it's about family. It's about immigrating to the United States. It's about working and living in the United States, studying in the United States. And there's all always family involved. Um, so certainly it comes up frequently. Um, but I think talking about the, the specific family sponsored categories, um, I know you'll want to go into that at some point. Um, do, do you want me to just go over it? You know, maybe we can just kind of jump into that. Um, sure. and, I yeah, can so move forward here. So is, is that the slide you were thinking of? Uh, I'm not sure. It might have been the one before. Ah, this one right here. Yes, just that very first category. Yep. Um, so, so when we talk about, you know, getting a green card in the United States, we, we usually think about the most common ways are employment based and family based. So whether it's an employer sponsoring you or a family member who has a green card or um, is a citizen and they're sponsoring you. So I'll just run through very quickly the, the different categories because people will call and say, I have, you know, a, a niece and I want to bring her into the United States because, you know, she wants to come and live with me, but you can't sponsor your niece. So so there are specific categories. So there's the um, immediate relative category. That's sort of the highest category. And that's the one, um, you know, Cindy, that I think comes up in your practice. And we'll talk a lot more about today. Um, but that's where you have spouses of U.S. citizens. It also includes minor children of U.S. citizens and parents of U.S. citizens. So that's sort of the, the you know, for lack of a better way of putting it, top category. Um, and it's the one where there's really not a wait. There are, there are visas available in that category. It's an unlimited number of visas. Um, then we start going down the line. And in the wait, usually... Um, is longer because there are, there are um, a limit on the number of visas available per year. And so as a result, um, you have to check and see, you know, what's available and when you filed. And, and so there's a wait time based on those things. So those categories in order, um, family first, um, it's unmarried sons and daughters of U.S. citizens. Um, uh, so they're adults, um, but they're they're not married. Um, and then second, uh, spouses and children and unmarried sons and daughters are permanent residents. Um, and that's split up into two categories, F2 and F A and F2B. Um, so spouses and children are permanent residents, F2A, and then F2B is unmarried sons and daughters, 21 years or older are permanent residents. Third is going to be married sons and daughters of U.S. citizens. And then finally, fourth is siblings of adult U.S. citizens. So those are the only um, five categories. So, you know, the, the immediate relative and then the four preference categories. Those are the only five categories where a family member can sponsor another family member for a green card to immigrate to the United States. Interesting. And one thing to keep in mind is uh, that, you know, we think of a legal adult in the U.S. as 18. For immigration purposes, it's 21. That's kind of the magic 
the magic number. So um, in with a lot of my clients who are business-based, if they've come with older children, one of the big concerns with timing is making sure that they can transmit the green card to their children before they age out of the system at 21. So that's just, I, I always tell folks, if you're thinking about particularly dealing with minor children who are getting older and the ultimate path for the family is the green card, you do want to keep in mind that 21 kind of hard cutoff um, because it goes from being, the, the petition goes from being an immediate relative petition where there's no quota to, um, I don't know what the visa bulletin says today, but um, to a bit of a wait uh, once they're 21 plus. So um, that's just something I always tell people to keep in mind. Okay, so when does a client's immigration status impact a family law case? I mean, we can talk about VAWA. Um, sure. An example. Sure. So, so there's two parts to every green card application. Uh, the first part is what's different for everybody. There's different categories, family, employment, investment. For our purposes today, we're really talking about family. So that's filed with what's called an I-130 immediate relative, uh, immigrant relative petition. And that puts people in the five categories that Shiva talked about. Um, so that's how someone qualifies. The second part of a green card application is, is the same for everybody. And if you're filing it in the United States, it's called an adjustment of status application. If you're outside of the United States, it's called an immigrant visa application. Um, and uh, where this comes up is often when something goes wrong. So an I-130 has been filed the, uh, or the whole green card application has been filed. It's pending with USCIS and something happens in the relationship. It breaks down. Um, Often I've seen it most where um, someone has gotten their green card and then people are getting divorced. Um, I've also done most of my pro bono practice is around something called VAWA and VAWA cases are for people, um, men or women, even though it's called the Violence Against Women Act, that's what authorized this particular type of green card application. Um, uh, it can be a uh, spouse, child, or parent who has experienced abuse by a U.S. citizen or a lawful permanent resident. Um, and that abuse does not necessarily need to be physical. It can be control, um, hoarding, financial resources, kind of it's, it's an expansive look at abuse. But one of the questions I get asked is, well, we had a big fight. Is that, does that qualify as VAWA? And my, my response is no, one big fight, one big fight is not enough. We need to really, even if it was really bad, even if it was really bad and you screamed and you stood in front of each other and lost your minds and screamed, screamed bloody murder at each other. That's not enough. What we're really looking for is a pattern of abuse, of extreme cruelty. So it's not just that your relationship broke down. Now, why does this matter? VAWA allows someone to basically get the green card even though they are no longer married. Um, because like I said, if the green card application is pending and folks get divorced, that application is over. It's done, it's over. Um, we're gonna talk about conditional green cards <laughs> in a few minutes. Um, but once the I-130 and the green card application have been approved and someone is a lawful permanent resident in the United States, if divorce happens after that, um, then that doesn't necessarily mean that the green card will be lost unless USCIS makes a finding that the marriage was entered into for the purpose of fraud or um, it wasn't a real marriage. So. It, it can be a really bad marriage as long as it was real uh, for, for, for immigrants. <laughs> I know that's a dumb, it's a dumb joke, um, but it, it just had to have been a real marriage. Um, so yeah, so that's kind of, for me, that's where it comes up. It also comes up in prenups where there's different, um, uh, where a couple decides that this is going to be what's best for them. 
Um, I know, Cindy, I don't know if this is where you want to chat about this, but um, uh, prenup does not uh, cancel out the affidavit of support that someone has to sign in order for their family member to apply for the green card. We get that um, question a lot, and I know you do, yeah. too, both of you. <laughs> yeah. yeah, so prenup does not negate the affidavit of support. But the affidavit of support, you're looking at, it's when you actually look at the numbers of what's required, it's not, it's pretty, it's, it's fairly minimal. You're typically going to be spending more in alimony or child support than anything that you would owe under the affidavit of support. Mm -hmm. Um, just a question about, um, special immigrant juvenile status. So I, um, that's something that has come up, like we, I, that would start in the family law, uh, court. And then, so for example, um, if there is a child that is in the country and under certain circumstance, I think we have like a, um, a slide about this particularly, but let me just actually move forward a little bit. Yeah, right here. Um, under very specific certain circumstance, um, if they're able to get an order out of the probate and family court, that they can then take that order as sort of the basis to get um, like a, it's a very expansive type of, is it a green card that they actually will get? Yes. So they can actually. Also, there's a wait. There's a really long wait right now, um, mm -hmm. but yes, it ultimately leads to the green card. And um, Danielle, you were saying something else um, before we started about how it's a little bit different than something like VAWA, because I think you were trying to make a distinction about S SIGE cases. Right. So SIGE cases are really going to come up for, um, for folks who have come here to the United States um, most of the time fleeing poverty, violence, and are here in the United States um, unlawfully, and they have been abandoned by a family member. So it's typically not going to come up in a divorce case um, or uh, or kind of within your, not typical, but your kind of typical family law practice. You're just not really going to see it. Mm -hmm. um, I've seen it mostly for nonprofit from, you know, my colleagues who work at nonprofits as well as, um, you know, uh, practices that focus more on removal in terms of helping kids. Um, the What's critical is that 21 year uh, age cutoff, where I believe the requirement is you have to have this, you have to have filed and have the final state order before you turn 21 in order to qualify. I believe that's that's the rule. So it's, it's very critical that if someone thinks that they're eligible for, for relief as a special immigrant juvenile, uh, that they get the balls rolling earlier rather than later. Hey, um, so I'm gonna move forward because some of this stuff, it's gonna be um, in some of these later slides, but um, so Shiva, um, can you explain what the fiance visas are and the petition? that are listed here and how does sure. that help you? Yeah. Sorry, Cindy, go ahead. Oh no, you're right. Um, I just, can you explain what those are? Yeah. So, um, so, um, I, we, we, when we think about, you know, getting a green card for the spouse or, or to be spouse of a U.S. citizen, um, oftentimes we think a lot about the timing and um, determines where we sort of figure out what the timing is as far as travel and being in the United States. And we go backwards from there and then figure out the best solution. So the three different types of processes that we think about um, are the fiance visa and then the two petitions listed here. Um, so a fiance visa is for individuals who are not yet married, um, but are free to marry. There are a few different requirements. You have to be free to marry. You can't be married to anybody else. Um, you uh, have to have met in person within the last two years. 
And of course, you have to prove a valid relationship. And so the petition for a fiance visa is filed inside the United States. And once it's approved, then the spouse who is outside the United States will go to the U.S. Embassy, obtain a fiance visa, come into the U.S., and once they enter the U.S., they have 90 days to get married and to file for a green card through adjustment of status. Um, 90 days seems like a long time, but it happens very, very quickly. And so that piece of it, I find to be quite restrictive because it's it's requiring people to, to get this done, not only get married, file. Um, and if they don't, um, you know, they can they can do it later. And, and sometimes we can, you know, and excuse that. And, um, you know, it's not the end of the world. But what they can't do is stay for some other reason, get married to somebody else. Um, you know, so it's very restrictive in that way. So that is one option. Um, and then the second one, it, um, you know, is the petition. And Danielle touched on this a little bit as well. Um, the underlying petition is called an I-130, so that gets filed inside the United States. The purpose of that is to prove, again, that there's a valid relationship between the parties and there's, there's a category, in this case, an immediate relative um, you know, visa available. And once that petition is approved, if the spouse is inside the United States, they would consular, um, they would adjust status similar to what they would do if they entered on a fiance visa. So that part of it is that second piece of it is very similar. And if they're outside the United States, they would consular process. So they would, you know, go through a bunch of paperwork, go to the U.S. Embassy, get their green card there, and then enter the United States. Um, the and they all work fine. You know, there, there's not one that's better than another. Um, but the timing uh, fluctuates, you know, with the petitions, how long is it taking now? How long is the fiance visa petition taking? That's a huge consideration. And whenever um, somebody is looking to do this, you know, you have to talk to a lawyer and kind of figure out, OK, you know, what's, what's the timing today? Um, and that doesn't necessarily mean that's what it's going to be tomorrow or six months from now. Um, and I see Danielle nodding a lot. So yes, you know, the, the timing, we just have no idea. Um, and then. Um, the other piece of it that's really important that we think about is um, travel. So if you're, um, you know, if you come in on a fiance visa or if you, you're in the U.S. and you have your petition approved and now you're filing for adjustment of status, in most visa categories, you can't travel while the petition is pending until your travel authorization is approved. So when you when you file your adjustment of status, you can file for a temporary travel authorization and employment authorization. But until that's approved, you're stuck in the United States. There's some statuses, H-1B and L-1 status, where you can travel without this. But in others, whether you're on a student visa or you know you came in on a visitor's visa, you can't. So you're stuck. And travel authorization can sometimes take, you know let's say three to nine months right now. I mean, it's just, a, it's such a long period. Um, and then the other piece of it is if you're, you know, consular processing and you're outside of the United States, sometimes you're stuck outside while you're waiting for that interview. Some, there are some, again, some visas you can come and go on and others you really can't make that happen. So you know that you're going to be stuck there. So what we usually do is, you know, talk to the couple and we say, all right, you know, are you married? Are you going to get married? When do you want to get married? And what does your um, sort of life situation look like? Do you need to work? Do you need to travel? Do you need to be in the United States? Do you need to be outside of the United States? Let's look at all of those dates and then back up into which one of these options is the best one. I don't know if you do it differently, okay. Danielle. That's how we sort of, you know, structure it. Yeah, no, I, I mean, you explained it perfectly. I think um, I was nodding when you talked about processing times, because that's the, that is the biggest question. And I think um, biggest client frustration is that, um, and, and sometimes I, I think clients don't believe me when I say, we just, we have no, there's no real insight. Uh, there's some, some data from USCIS's website but it is true when your immigration lawyer tells you um, this is what they're saying, but it could be shorter, it could be longer. Um, you know, with with travel permission, for instance, um, uh, USCIS and their divine wisdom decided to separate processing of work and travel, that temporary work and travel permission that Shiva mentioned. Um, so before the pandemic, those things were done together, and you get this nifty nifty little card that gave you work and travel permission. And that typically issued in 90 to 120 days. That's typically what I saw. Now I'm seeing my clients get their temporary work permission based on a green card, pending green card application in about 60 to 120 days, sometimes much longer. And then most of my family-based clients are getting their green cards before travel permission ever issues. Uh, so it's, it's, I think, um, I really try to talk a lot with my clients and make sure they understand that 
uh, U.S. immigration, once your application is in, is, is, is it's not a total black hole, <laughs> but, you know, I, we, we don't have, it's not like how, even if we're dealing with a frustrating company or a frustrating customer service experience where we can call and speak to the manager, that doesn't exist in USCIS. Um, you know, uh, and, I, and I, I, I will often tell clients, um, particularly if we have a case that is taking longer than expected and they want us to, um, there, there are some mechanisms to reach out and I tell them uh, to, to level set expectations that, um, you know, immigration lawyers call the USCIS's phone number 1-800-USELESS <laughs> uh, because it's just, it's, it's, it's like screaming into the void. So, um, you know, I, I think the, the really important piece of all of this is to have patience, which is really, really hard because, um, you know, it's, it's, it's really, really, it's really hard to be in limbo and wait. So I, I, I just second everything Shiva, Shiva just said. <laughs> I've yeah. noticed, oh, I'm sorry. No, please go ahead. I've noticed with, you know, prenups where there's immigration issues, you know, normally if someone, you know, they, they want to have a prenup, they'll say, okay, our wedding date is this, but usually if there's immigration issues, it's like, well, well it's going to be between this date and this date. And so it's always kind of a moving target. And sometimes it seems to get moved up abruptly or. Well, cause I've, I will, I've had uh, many clients get engaged right after they get off the phone with me from an initial consultation. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, uh, because I also tell people, uh, you know, for, for a marriage based petition, I don't need you to have a big church wedding. You can have it, you know, you can, particularly with all the travel restrictions and stuff like that. I just need you to get legally married. Right. And to have a real relationship. So I have a lot of clients who will just go to city hall and get married so that we can get things filed. So that's also when a prenup comes up, I tell folks, if you, if that's something that you are interested in doing, and that's important to you, you need to kind of get the ball, the ball rolling with that as soon as possible, because, uh, you know, um, busy family lawyers like Cindy, you know, it's not something that can appear out of the out of the air within, you know, 15 minutes, it's a, it's an actual process. Yeah. So yeah, no, I'm not surprised you, you see marriage, marriage dates get pushed up abruptly. They probably talk to their immigration lawyer. <laughs> All <That's right>. my <laughs> I'm going to move on to the next slide. What is conditional residence? Uh, oh, I'll, I'll take, I'll take this one. I'll take this one. So, um, so conditional residence is if someone is granted a green card based on a marriage that is less than two years old when the green card is granted. Mm -hmm. um, and so what happens is that the, the beneficiary, so the, the foreign national, gets their green card and it's only valid for two years. And they have to file a petition to remove the conditions on their green card um, in the 90 day window between their two year, uh, uh, before their two year anniversary of getting the green card. Okay. So if someone's two year anniversary of getting the green card was today, October 5th, 2023, the window for filing this petition to remove conditions would have opened 90 days, 90 days ago. And basically it's uh, because getting married to a US citizen is one of the fastest and frankly, the least restricted ways to get a green card or permanent residence in the United States, um, the conditional residence requirement gives people the gives USCIS the opportunity to take another look and to confirm that there was not marriage fraud. Mm -hmm. Now, um, because I've had this happen with clients, sometimes relationships fail, uh, things don't work out, um, and so I've had I've had panicked phone calls from clients who have the conditional green card and they're getting divorced. Um, or I actually just had a client whose husband died Ooh. and um, very, very, very sad. Um, and I always tell them your relationship was real unless they're totally lying to me and fabricating every piece of evidence that we've submitted on their behalf to USCIS, your relationship was real. Divorce doesn't change that. Uh, death doesn't change that. It just changes um, when we file that petition. So if there has been a death of the U.S. citizen spouse or a divorce, once you have the death certificate or the final divorce decree, you can file the petition to remove conditions at any time. 
However, for most people who remain married, it's when that 90 day window before the second anniversary of them getting the green card. Um, now, one of the things I always tell my clients is that I want them to become US citizens as fast as possible so that they don't have to deal with immigration ever again if they don't want to. Um, so US citizen, uh, someone who is married to a US citizen can apply for naturalization, so the process to become a US citizen, um, three years after they've, they only need three years of time in lawful permanent resident status uh, if they're married to a US citizen. It's typically five years for everyone else. Um, the reason why I bring this up now is that USCIS tends to take years to adjudicate the I-751, the petition to remove conditions. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, so some people have the mistaken belief that they have to wait for USCIS to adjudicate that petition before they file their naturalization application. And that's not the case. Um, I tell my clients that the fastest way to get them to adjudicate the condi conditional residency application is to file for naturalization on that three year anniversary date. Um, and they'll adjudicate, USCIS will adjudicate both petitions on the same day as the naturalization interview. Interesting. That was a lot of information. <laughs> it is. Um, I, I'll just say that the most common question I think, Cindy, that I've heard from your clients is exactly what Danielle said about, you know, the relationship didn't work out. This is how I got my green card. Can I still yeah. get my green card? That's the biggest piece. And, and you know, Danielle explained that very clearly, but I, like there was so much of it. I just wanted to highlight that piece of it. You know, if you're going to file your, your I-751 um, petition to remove condition of residence, it's either I'm still married, we're filing jointly, or um, we're separated, divorced, about to get divorced, um, and I'm, I'm filing on my own, but look, it was still a valid relationship. Or three, I believe there's a ground for, um, you know, like an abusive relationship as well. Um, but the 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 answer is yes, you can still keep your green card as long as your relationship was a valid one. What about, um, I, I think you've answered this question, but I know um, someone once asked me about, well, I helped the person get a green card. Now, you know, we're going through a divorce and what can I do to get it undone? <laughs> I mean, basically, they're just you're out of luck. <laughs> yeah, so, yeah, I mean, I've had, I have dealt with the aftermath mm -hmm. of phone calls that are made to um, immigration by disgruntled exes, whether they be spouses or girlfriends or boyfriends, um, vindictive friends, uh, because ICE does have a tip line. Mm -hmm. um, I always, anytime I'm speaking with someone who is feeling very angry about that and kind of wants to interfere with that process or make a report, I, I personally don't participate in that. Mm -hmm. um, and I tell them, like, it was a real, if it was a, I mean, you're basically saying that you committed marriage fraud, which is a federal crime. Mm -hmm. uh, I mean, I can't. <laughs> Right, exactly. No, but like, I know yeah, that's what you're saying. <laughs> I can think of just one instance where the person said, no, no, it was real. It's just that, you know, can I now undo no. support? And I'm like, no, no. Anywho. All right. Next. All right. We talked about VAWA. We talked a little bit about SIDGE. All right. Yeah. So, um, we're gonna, we've, we've kind of talked a little bit about this so far, about how divorce can impact immigration status. Um, what about annulments or like, um, what have you seen where you find out that, or someone thinks they're divorced, maybe they're not, or in other situations where somebody knows they're not divorced and <laughs> tries to get married to somebody here? Any experiences with that? <laughs> Go ahead, Shiva. Okay. <laughs> so I think that those are sort of um, more unusual situations. They certainly do come up. Um, you know, one of the things I mentioned earlier is, you know, for the fiance visa, you have to be free to marry. So you can't be married to somebody else. And so sometimes people will not realize their divorce isn't finalized, or they'll think that because they're married in another country and maybe it doesn't count in the United States. Um, you know, it, it can be any of those situations and that can impact your 
um, what you do going forward. So if you say you weren't married and then you have, um, you know, a, an immigration benefit approved based on, um, you know, a marriage to somebody else, then that marriage isn't recognized in the United States because you, you can't, you know, you can't marry um, if you're married to somebody else. And so you have to go back and correct it. And, you know, an annulment uh, may be one way to do it. Um, and, you um, I, I think, um, Danielle, I think you you had points out when we were kind of talking about this earlier that you had an interesting situation where, you know, you go on later on down the line and now the person's trying to file for, you know, a child that was from this marriage that didn't actually happen, you know, but it did. Right. And, and, child, and, and now you can't petition for the child because you have to explain, um, you know, that that child is yours. And if you said that you weren't married, you know, how are you going to, you know, and then and the, it's on the birth certificate, you know, how are you going to go about that? Um, I, I think it creates a lot of complications in that way. Um, it, it, they are more unusual situations. And, um, you know, sometimes there's a question as to whether a marriage was valid if a prior marriage ended on a certain date and, you know, how did it all work? So sometimes a lot of research to be done. I will also point out that this also comes up in um, the context of other type, not just green cards, but non-immigrant visas. So if somebody is here on a work visa, like an H-1B or an L-1, and they're married and they're going to now have a, you know, get a divorce, but the spouse is dependent on that visa, um, you know, the spouse can't stay if they're not still married right. because of the basis of the, of the, of the visa. Um, and so, you know, it, it does impact, um, you know, spouses. Um, and so you have to think about, well, you know, are we going to move the person's status, you know, before they get divorced? And again, timing is always the biggest piece of it. Um, but what opportunities are, are available? What what benefits could possibly be available for the spouse who now lives here, wants to live here, the children are here, um, you know, but but they're getting a divorce. Um, so those are the things that I can think of. Danielle, do you have any other situations? I think that's, those are the big ones. Um, uh, this is actually a family law uh, issue that I worked on. Um, where uh, there was fear that a uh, foreign national dad who was the citizen of a non-Hague country would leave the U.S. with the U.S. citizen children mm -hmm. on foreign passports, and that because of the cultural practices of this particular country, that U.S. citizen mom is persona non grata there, and these children, for all intents and purposes, are gone. Um, and I uh, forever um, until they're old enough to get to the U.S. Embassy and get their own passport and, and leave this country. Um, there are no fly lists, but you have to make sure that your child is both on a U.S. citizen no fly list. And also there is, I can't, it's been such a long time since I dealt with this case, but there is also a no fly list that will tag them even if they're trying to fly out on a foreign passport. Wow. And that's really critical, particularly for non-Hague. Um, and the, what, I'm, what I mean by non-Hague is that there are certain treaty agreements between different countries where they will cooperate if there is an international custody dispute. So if, you know, mom or dad leaves and takes the kids to England or France, you know, it doesn't mean that U.S. citizen parent in Boston is now up a paddle and you know has no recourse to these other countries to get children back into the United States or whatever. Although um, it can still be complicated, <laughs> right? Still yeah. very complicated and awful to deal with. Right. But um, you know, there, there, uh, it, it's it's a really it can be really scary a really scary thing to do. So whenever dealing with countries from non Hague. Uh, countries, I always make sure, particularly if dad has never really been involved, that mom makes a, or whatever parent, it's typically U.S. citizen mom, U.S. citizen mom makes sure that she has a full custody, like has a very formalized custody grant from the family court so that there's no question that dad cannot just march in and abscond with the children. We once um, had a situation where, um, you know, we were presented with a divorce decree from a, a foreign country and we had a lot of concern about its validity and we ended up having to retain counsel in that country. It was basically like the head of the Women's Bar Association of that country. And that person went into the courts and found out, found out that those documents were actually forged. So the marriage in this country was invalid. And so that's how we, that, you know, it's, it's amazing, but it happens. Yeah. 
It does. It does. All right. So what I'm going to do now, I'm just going to check our questions. And... All right. So for our questions, I've got um, this one's for Shiva. What happens if I have not maintained lawful status, but I marry a U.S. citizen? Can I still get a green card? That's a very good question. Yes. And, um, you know, usually if you're not in status, it's very difficult to adjust status to permit resident. However, um, you know, as we were saying earlier, marriage to a U.S. citizen is one of the fastest and, and most straightforward ways of getting a green card. There's an exception. So if you're married to a U.S. citizen, um, if you're married to a U.S. citizen, you fall out of status you still can go through and, you know, to the end and, and successfully, get, get, successfully get your green card without having to leave the U.S. and come back in, which would otherwise be the remedy, so long as you, you're able to prove that you entered the country lawfully. So you just need, you know, some document that says you got here lawfully, and it could have been 20 years ago and you fell out of status. That's still okay. You can still, um, if you're married to a U.S. citizen, you can still adjust status and get a green card. Excellent. All right. So this one's for Danielle. What's the biggest mistake you see in self-filed petitions? Oh, uh, I think the the biggest mistake is assuming that immigration is about paperwork. Um, now, obviously, the paperwork is a critical part of the application, and you know, for all of my clients, I take care of it and prepare it. But the the biggest problem I see when I'm retained to play cleanup when someone has represented themselves and now they've dug themselves into a hole is um, thinking things don't matter, not disclosing things, particularly things that they think USCIS will never know about. So things like um, run-ins with the police, uh, entering and overstaying and then entering again and like just pieces of preparing a very inaccurate application um or not or not it's just inaccurate it's not and it's not necessarily intentional it's just inaccurate mm -hmm. um and and the problem is with u.s immigration is that once you, the momentum of the federal government and the u.s immigration bureaucracy is against you it is very 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 difficult to turn it around it's not the type of thing where um, I use the example of if you make a mistake on your IRS tax returns, let's say they audit you and it's a big pain, it's a big pain and it's expensive, but at the end of the day, you're most likely going to pay a fine and move on with your life. Mm -hmm. In immigration, your ability to work or live with your family in the United States can be affected. Wow. So it just, it, it really, it's just being inaccurate or putting contradictory things that confuse an officer um confuse an officer when they're looking at it i had a case where um spouses lived separately they were they were legitimately married had been together for a million years and it just happened that the way their jobs worked out is that they lived in separate parts of the us and they commuted back and forth regularly but these folks made the oh it's just paperwork uh it's just paperwork and listed out their address history and they didn't disclose that wife was living somewhere else. And then when USCIS went into the public records, there were inaccuracies. And as I tell people, I was like, it's not that these people weren't married. They were actually married. We, they should have hired immigration counsel like myself or like Shiva or other competent immigration counsel to explain to immigration Yes, these people are really married, even though they live in separate states for work reasons. Um, so that's, I think that's, that's a long, long winded answer to that question. No, and this has been great. And I see that we're um, at the end of our time, but I want to thank Shiva and Danielle for sharing their expertise with us. I know that when our worlds collide of family law and immigration law, that it's good to have those connections. And um, I'm just gonna, I think we've got Shiva's contact info, um, on the PDF. So if anyone is interested in, in getting that, we're happy to send that out, or you can email, um, our office and same thing with Danielle. Um, we're happy to put you in contact. 
So um, thank you all very much. I'm going to stop the recording now and sign off. Thanks all. Thank